let me ask uh steve we've we've you've testified in front of our committee previously uh but it may have been at a point in time when we had some other members uh but i don't think we have met in person uh, each of your colleagues who are here so would it be helpful for us to introduce ourselves and then invite you to introduce yourself and your colleagues why don't we do that and again uh, i think Picking up on the suggestion, I'll start and then we'll go around. We'll go around the room as if we're in the room, which was how we all organize our, our, mental, our mental picture of ourselves. Uh, I'm Representative Bill Lippert uh, from Heinsburg and chair of the House Healthcare Committee. And I'm going to turn to my right to the vice chair of our committee, uh, and let her introduce herself. And then we'll go around the room and then we'll go back to Steve and have you introduce yourself and then. Uh, invite your colleagues to introduce themselves as well as our and, and our staff before we uh, go back to you, Steve. Uh, yeah, Representative Van Donahue. I'm from Northfield and also represent Berlin. I'm Peter Reed. I uh, live in Braintree, represent Randolph, Brookfield, Braintree, Granville, and Roxbury. I think you're muted. Emory, I think you're muted. Sorry, um, I'm Representative Anne Marie Christensen. I live in Wethersfield and also represent Cavendish. Representative Lucy Rogers, Waterville, and Cambridge. Uh, good morning, uh, Representative David Durfee from Shaftesbury uh, in Bennington County. I'm Representative Brian Smith, uh, represent the towns of Derby, Morgan, Charleston, Holland, and Brownington. Representative Mari Cordes from Addison County, Lincoln, Bristol, Moncton, and Starksboro, and a nurse volunteer for the Open Door Clinic that hasn't been there in a while. <laughs> Hi, this is Brian Chena from Burlington, Vermont, and I represent a part of the Old North End and uh, the most of the East District. And I'm Whitman Page. I'm calling from Newport. And I represent Newport, Newport Center, Irisburg, Hawkesbury, and North Troy. And I'm Lori Houghton, and I represent Essex Junction. Okay, how about uh, Jen and uh, Nolan, would you like to introduce yourselves, and, and Demis and Sean? Sure, I'm Jen Carby. I'm Deputy Chief Counsel from the Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, I'm Nolan Langwell. I'm with the Joint Fiscal Office. My name is Demis Martin and I'm the committee assistant. And Sean Island is joining us as our IT person this morning as well. So Steve, why don't we turn to you, have you introduced yourself and then have your colleagues be introduced and then we'll proceed from there. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Steve Meyer. I am the executive director of Vermont's free and referral clinics. Uh, we were formerly known as the Co uh, Vermont Coalition of Clinics for the Uninsured, uh, but for a variety of reasons uh, this year uh, decided to uh, start doing business as Vermont's free and referral clinics. As that started in February, we were going to kick that off with our uh, uh, clinics day at the legislature in February, which was on the huge snow day, so that didn't happen. So. But here we are. I'll tell a little bit more um, in a minute, but I'll let um, Heidi and others um, introduce themselves. Yes, just do our brief introductions. And then when we come back around, you can say more about your organizations as we come back around for testimony. Does that work? Sure. My name is Heidi Sulis. I'm the executive director of the Open Door Clinic in Middlebury. Oh, great. My name's Lynn Raymond Dempy. I'm the executive director of Valley Health Connections in Springfield, Vermont. Okay, welcome. And I'm Dana Mikulovic. I'm the executive director of Good Neighbor Health Clinic and Red Logan Dental Clinic in White River Junction. Great. Well, welcome to you all. So let me let me try to start and, and tee this up. Uh, as we've been looking at, uh, we're particularly interested in understanding. What it, what's being experienced throughout the state in healthcare around the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the pressures uh, that it's putting on the healthcare system of Vermont. Uh, we 
have been hearing from uh, representatives from uh, hospitals. We'll hear, this afternoon, we'll be hearing from uh, the FQHCs as well as uh, at least the representative of UVMMC, and I'm sure we'll be hearing from other hospital representatives as well. Uh, as we thought about where there might be pressure points around the state and where there have always been uh, in some ways uh, pressure points is the what well, I, pardon me, but I still say the free clinics. Uh, so we'll, we'll work up to getting to know how to refer to you as your preferred name. Uh, but it is, I think it's new to new to us. Um, so we, we recognize that the role you play is uh, an important role in our communities across the state. But I think it's important for us to understand uh, what you're seeing uh, in this acute uh, time as well. So Steve, even though we didn't have a chance to hear from your folks because of the big snow day and then rescheduling just didn't work because, well, this is our rescheduling in some ways, but, uh, but we'd like to focus on both understanding the nature of the work that you're doing generally, but that's also focused on the COVID-19 uh, pressures and experience. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Steve, and then have you work with uh, your witnesses. And I think we have, um, uh, we have some time. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again. Um, yeah, I'm just going to take uh, two or three minutes and give a, a general overview of the work that we do um, around Vermont. And uh, I provided Demis with a general background document that I assume you have in front of you or could look up. Um, if that's a problem, I, I don't know if you allow me to share a screen, but I could do that um, if that would be useful. But I think rather than my suggestion would be not to focus so much on that, but just, just a couple of highlights so you have a general sense of the, the work that the free clinics do around the state and then move right directly to the clinic directors and, and how they're managing their work um, these days with COVID-19. Free clinics um, in general pro serve about 9,000 Vermonters per year, um, uh, a little bit less this last year. Uh, and the types of services we provide, um, each clinic does thing, does a different array of services, uh, and some of them do them slightly differently, but uh, among the things that the clinics provide are direct medical and dental care um, to uh, uninsured and underinsured patients. One of the reasons we changed our name is that it was clinics, the Coalition of Clinics for the Uninsured. We have found over the last several years that more and more of the people we serve are, are not necessarily uninsured. So there's, uh, there are issues there we could discuss if you're interested, but, um, and we also provide uh, referral services within a uh, hospital or other networks, our community networks. We provide a lot of uh, sister services, what used to be called navigation. Uh, we help people get connected into Medicaid and uh, Vermont Health Connect and other private insurance. Um, we provide help uh, with lower costs or free medications uh, in some cases. Uh, so, and I'm, those are touching on the, the highlights. You can see in our summary, uh, some of the other kinds of services and the numbers that go along with them. Um, uh, we have, uh, we are celebrating, and I put that word in quotation marks, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary as a coalition this year. Uh, so you may be surprised to know that free clinics have been around this long. Most of the early um, leaders of the free clinics, the people that set them up, uh, all did so with the hope and expectation that we would not be around 25 years later. Um, and though here we are, we continue to serve an increasing number of Vermonters each year. Um, and the need for our services seems to it has changed over the years. We do do different things, some many different things than we did before, but the need for our services continues to grow um, for better and for worse, perhaps. Anyway, I think I'll stop there. Um, and uh, I think the lineup we agreed on was that, Dana, are you prepared to go first? And then we'll hand it off to Lynn and Heidi will do cleanup. Super, thank you. Thank you all for inviting us to 
come and testify before you today. The Good Neighbor Health Clinic is one of five freestanding medical and dental clinics that is part of the nine member coalition of, of our network. Good Neighbor operates with 24 licensed medical volunteers and 12 licensed dentists. And annually, these volunteers mentor over 50 medical and dental students. That's a big part of our operation is passing along the knowledge from uh, the just maybe just retired generation to the generation that's coming through um, professional school at the moment. Uh, they provide 3,000 medical and dental visits. What's really important for you to know is that all nine of our member organizations have very lean staffs. And in normal times, I think that's an asset. As we go through this unprecedented time, it, is, it has become very much of a challenge. The freestanding clinics that provide care, typically we've seen patients in the offices, um, have modified their business operations and we're providing care via phone, both to new and existing patients. Good Neighbor is very fortunate in that we have an electronic medical record and we also have a nurse practitioner on staff. So we were able to set up about two weeks ago to do our work remotely and to talk with our patients. We're providing acute care, triage for COVID-19 and um, filling prescriptions for those patients who rely on us for their primary care. Of note, I believe, is that yesterday we received a notice from HRSA, they, and they provide the malpractice liability insurance for all of our medical providers. And um, they have extended their coverage to telehealth. I will tell you that Good Neighbor has yet to figure out the protocol for telehealth. However, I was on a phone call with colleagues this morning, and People's Health and Wellness in Barry is ahead of the curve on that and they have um they're going to share with us the information on how they've done that our volunteer providers are mostly retired so they're in a high risk age, age group and they would prefer to provide telehealth at this time currently we know that we are deferring er visits and we also know that people are becoming um those who lived maybe precarious lives, maybe some who didn't are becoming unemployed. And we, we feel, conf I don't wanna say confident, that's not really the right word, but we're expecting a surge in a demand for our services when we um, get a little bit on the other side of the current crisis and people who are unemployed and have their health insurance end reach out to the free clinics, both for care and for assistance in enrolling in insurance plans. <clears throat> um, we've, we've shifted our entire business model as a result of COVID-19. We're working harder than ever to provide care for patients who call us. So uh, that's the extent of my testimony. I think we'll turn it over to Lynn. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lynn Raymond Empey. I'm the executive director of Valley Health Connections and we're a referral free clinic program. So uh, we provide uh, referral directly into providers offices, Springfield Medical Care System, Springfield Hospital, use their charity care programs to help people access care. We also do an awful lot of outreach and enrollment. Last year, we served Vermonters from 44 different towns um, mostly in the Windsor and Wyndham County area. Um, and with our three, three and a quarter full-time equivalent staff members, um, we served just under 1400 Vermonters last year. Um, on March 17th, it became pretty clear that we needed to change the way we were doing business um, and no longer continue the face-to-face -face services that we were providing. But we obviously still need to continue to provide those services to patients. So we have started working remotely. 
um, and the staff, myself, we've all worked very hard to come up with processes to do the outreach and enrollment, to help patients get um, verification submitted, whatever it is they need to do to get the help they need. Um, and last, in the month of March, even though half of that time, our doors were basically closed and we were just helping patients via phone, email, however else we could get hold of them. Um, we served actually more patients this March than we did last year with our doors wide open. So there continues to be a need. We definitely can do this, um, but it's a constantly changing landscape as I'm sure you know. Um, one of the big things we did over the past week and a half was in reach to over 100 Vermonters in our database that we knew were not insured. Um, contacting them to help them take, a, take a advantage of the special enrollment period that's been open through Vermont Health Connect through April 17th. Um, so we felt that was really important. Um, during our calls, we actually were able to connect quite a few people. So it's, it's been a good exercise along with all the other stuff we're doing, trying to get those calls done was really important. Um, we actually had one patient who had sent in an application uh, over a month ago to Vermont Health Connect. She had not received any correspondence. We contacted Vermont Health Connect on her behalf, found out that the issue was, it was just laying there waiting for the, her to do plan selection. Had we not done the call and followed up for her, her application would have closed after 60 days from being non-responsive. And what we were able to do because we made that call was get her enrolled. She already had a number of medical bills uh, that she had to pay and she needed additional medical care. So those calls are definitely worth it. Um, we're also looking at doing some outreach to some of our older patients, more, um, more concerned about the isolation factor for them and checking in on them and making sure they're okay. And because of the database we have, because we share it with the VCCU, it makes that, that kind of contact and that kind of in-reach possible. Um, one, of the, one of the other things that, that's been happening, and actually this was occurring prior to the start of the COVID-19 issue, was um, Medicaid apps seem to be going really, really slowly in the system, trying to get people on. I wasn't really quite sure what was going on. We've been in close contact with our partners at Diva, in particular with Victoria Jarvis, who does the assister program, uh, letting us know that you know they're doing a lot of manual reviews and they're not terminating people, which is good, but that same manual process that's not terminating people is also slowing down the process to get people on. So I've had two children waiting to get on Dr. Dinosaur. Application was completed in March. Income verification scanned and received by Vermont Health Connect back in, back in February, excuse me. It was completed in February. The verification was in in February. And now we're into April. And those two kids still are not on. I've made multiple calls on a regular basis. I just did another outreach yesterday to uh, the actual sister program saying, somebody's got to help me. So, um, you know, those kinds of issues are ongoing. They existed before COVID-19. And I think COVID-19 has just kind of exacerbated them in a system that's trying to do manual stuff. And, and any changes you make to the portal and the way Vermont Health Connect does business kind of throws things into a tizzy. And I think you're all well aware of that. So that's an ongoing issue. Um, one of the other things we found out just like a couple of days ago is the assister line is down because of the COVID-19 outbreak. So what you may not be aware of is we deal oftentimes with very complex issues related to getting people enrolled and insured. And so people wind up coming to us because they've tried to do it on their own, but for some reason it's not happening and they need our help and assistance. And what we have is a special assister line. So, and these are operators that are, uh, understand assisters. We have an assister number. They certify that we can speak on behalf of the patient. And they're also well-trained, well-experienced operators because we're dealing with highly complex issues. The assister line is gone. So um, now- The assister line, the assister line at- Help me understand that more clearly. This because it's closed right now. It's closed right now to the COVID-19 outbreak. They had to allocate oh, yeah. their call center personnel, all of them to the customer service line to deal with all Vermonters, which I certainly understand because they're overwhelmed. But that leaves us without an important resource. So what that would mean is that in order for us to call that uh, we could call that customer service line, but we would have to be conferenced in with the patient and maybe wait on um, online, maybe like a half hour, depending on how busy they are, to just wait to talk to somebody. And 
the people on the regular customer service line have varying levels of knowledge when it comes to some of the complex issues we're dealing with. Lots of times we need to go to eligibility or I don't know if you've heard of tier two, tier three, tier four, when you have these issues. So we deal with a lot of those and that's not something most of the folks on the regular line are familiar with. So it's an issue. We're working closely with Diva, with Victoria Jarvis. We we met with them this morning just before coming here for the testimony um, to talk to them about what we can do uh, trying to use an assister inbox and maintain HIPAA privacy laws and uh, trying to do it in some of these things have to be done very quickly because people need medications. We have people with psych issues and stuff who are just really struggling to get some of their meds because of, come of some because of some issues with their coverage. Um, and so it, it's critical. That assister line is critical. And um, so we're, that's that's an issue we're really working on. Um, we also, so for, for our clinic in particular, we deal with a lot of people who are insured. Um, in 2019, 45, 47% of our patients were above the Medicaid threshold, which means they were on like a qualified health plan. So with those folks now going through job changes, job loss, all those things, there's a lot of income changes going on. The problem is when they're on a qualified health plan, and they're making an income change through Vermont Health Connect. If it didn't happen prior to March 15th, that premium is not gonna get changed for the next month. So they're gonna owe the regular premium for, for April, and then not until hopefully Mar May 1st, that premium amount will be changed. But the problem is if with the backlog in the unemployment system, and not getting those funds, and they don't have the income to pay the insurance premium, that amount, if that rides in arrears for 90 days, they're gonna lose coverage. And they're not gonna have an SEP because it's gonna be done for non-payment. So looking ahead, please please keep your eyes on that situation. It's, it's a concern of mine, particularly because we have so many people making income changes right now. And it, it's, you know, the portal just cannot respond as quickly as we need it to to make the changes. So, and for some of these people also trying to file for the unemployment claims, um, their social security <clears throat> numbers are not being recognized they're, and they're having to call. So it's not taking hours, it's taking days for them to get through. And even once they get through, um, the question is how much are they gonna get? When is it gonna start? I don't think we know. I know there's a lot of issues regarding that. I know the legislature's working on them, but it does create a complex issue for our patients. Okay, well, I also, I wanna say thank you for, I, I, one of the questions I have on the list of questions was uh, the open enrollment period and uh, hearing you talk about the in-reach that you're doing uh, is, Good to hear. Uh, also, uh, let me just throw it out there, a question. Well, let, let's hear from your colleague and, and, and if any of you who wish to comment about the open enrollment period, plus the, of course there's ongoing difficulties as you indicated with even the change of circumstance around uh, finances, which is happening, uh, which, which triggers, triggers uh, enrollment changes as well. But let, let's hear from, uh, is it Dana? Let's hear from Dana and then we'll go back and open it up for questions from the committee. We heard from Dana, it'd be Heidi. I'm, I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, pardon it's pardon me. Uh, and I, I would also like to say thank you for this important opportunity Heidi. to thank speak you. with all of you. Um, much of my feedback really echoes my colleagues, Lynn and Dana. Um, when I think very starkly about how this pandemic has affected us, it's changed entirely how we too are doing business and conducting services. We still have paper charts here at the clinic. And so um, that just gives you a feel that uh, some of us still need to, we actually have three people working here um, at the office and the rest of my staff is working from remotely from home. And so when we're in close proximity to one another, we're wearing these and washing our hands a lot um, and doing a lot of social distancing. None of us is sharing an office right now. Um, so early on, we worked with our volunteer medical director, Dr. Lynn Larson, to 
help us figure out how to navigate this um, uh, unprecedented time, which every, the word everyone is using. And so early on, we decided that um, uh, we would also defer all um, kind of routine appointments and um, really um, add some clout to the triaging that our nurses do. So we have two nurses here who have been triaging all of our patient calls um, since we stopped providing our clinics per se, our in-person clinics of which we hold 10 to 13 a month. Um, and one thing unique to our clinic here is out of um, nearly a thousand unduplicated patients that we saw last year, um, a good third of them are our local Latino migrant farm workers. And so we have staffing and services um, in Spanish all of the time. So Julia, our outreach nurse who speaks Spanish, has been taking our cell phone um, to cover all of our Spanish speaker um, calls and concerns. And Jody has been um, dealing with the rest of the population. And our navigator, Melanie, is taking all of the navigation calls around uh, health insurance. So. Um, Currently, that's kind of how we're looking. We're serving all of our people. We're triaging. If there are any suspected COVID calls, those are further triaged with Dr. Larson. Um, and our backup plan is that if she gets overloaded, she is a primary care provider in our community and a hospitalist. So burnout could become a real issue for them. Um, we have a former medical director and another one of our volunteers who have stepped in and said they would be more than happy to help um, see patients, triage calls, et cetera. We're doing some telehealth visits um, and Lynn has been doing those uh, with Julia primarily thus far. So that's kind of how um, we're conducting our, our normal business um, at this point in time. We have a lot of concerns around language access for our Spanish speaking patients and I have been working with um, some of the people in incident command at Porter Hospital to see if they would be open to and if it would be helpful for them to have a list of our interpreters um, should they get um, bombarded with or I, I think what we think given the fact of um, how the migrant workers work and live. We expect that a cluster of people could come in to the hospital at a given time and overwhelm their um, limited language access capacity. So we're working with them to try to support them and come up with creative ways where we could bring in remotely a trained interpreter to help with the Spanish speaking patients. We're also, um, this is kind of cool and I think um, not that I can claim to be a native Vermonter, but um, I want to show you this. As you have all heard and appreciate, um, we cannot get supplies. And that's something that I think is really important to let you all know about. We can't get thermometers. We can't get hand sanitizer. And so um, some of our local companies, you probably, you might have read about this, um, kombucha, the Vermont Soap Company, Appalachian Distillery have been making special batches of hand sanitizer for our local hospital. And we um, got eight gallons ourselves. And so we're preparing some COVID boxes for outreach to our farms that will include hand sanitizer that we're putting in ketchup bottles from our local dollar store, uh, handmade masks, ibuprofen, some soap, and um, some patient education in Spanish for the migrant workers. Julia also did a mailing to um, farm owners a couple of weeks ago with that basic information um, to try to instill some of these safe, safer practices for their workers. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing and how business is um, looking a little different than usual. And I think, again, to echo a lot of what Lynn said, 
we have real concerns. I have real concerns. You know, a big piece of our work is to increase access to care in a number of different ways. And one of those ways is to help people access health insurance. And I think as people become laid off, unemployed, um, you know, our navigator, our navigators, our assisters um, are going to be swamped. And if the overarching system continues to be plagued with traffic and technical difficulties, um, it's it's going to be a mess. It's it's already kind of messy, and I don't mean to be critical, but um, people needing to wait for days and weeks to get onto insurance is unsettling at best and um, uh, horrible practice. So I have concerns over time about people being laid off, unemployed, if they're lucky to go back to work, lucky enough in six or 12 or however this lasts, 18 weeks, um, it's conceivable that their insurance status will change again because now they're back on income and they won't qualify for the plan they're on and need to switch plans. And so I've, I um, am concerned about our system being able to accommodate um, all of all of this and access for our Vermont for Vermonters um, through this pandemic. And so I just wanted to read a story in conclusion um, that highlights this. Um, and this was written by our navigator, Melanie Clark, who was a superstar. Um, but I think this shows you, I think sometimes we take for granted that, you know, getting health insurance is like lickety splickety and um, I think the, the people here today um, can attest to the fact that it can be a very cumbersome, cumbersome, protracted process that takes a lot of knowledgeable people to help Vermonters with. So anyway, Sally is a young Vermonter who works for a local restaurant. I've helped her over the years update her Vermont Health Connect account whenever she's changed jobs or needed to complete Medicaid renewals. Just about a month ago, Sally came in because she was finally making enough that she was no longer eligible for Medicaid and would have to pick a health insurance plan through Vermont Health Connect. She was both proud of the fact that she was now making a decent living, but extremely anxious about having to pick a health insurance plan. She had looked online and couldn't understand how the plans worked and what terms like out-of-pocket maximum, deductible, co-payment, or co-insurance meant. This was a strange new world where she would now have to pay a monthly premium and still be expected to pay a portion of her own healthcare expenses. It made no sense and she was struggling to understand how this would impact her financially. Sally's feelings of anxiety and confusion aren't unique to her. There's a great deal of stress when transitioning from what is known to what is unknown just like we're all doing now. Most individuals who transition off from Medicaid for the first time feel the same way. In these times when we are most vulnerable, a familiar face and a community, community connection, our sisters, make all the difference in the world. Sally came into my office, we updated her account, and then went over insurance terms, how, plan, how plans work, and what subsidies are. We discussed the importance of updating income information, how to make payments, and next steps. We even talked about her budget to ensure she would be able to afford what she wanted. Although daunting at first, understanding health insurance is much easier when explained with patients' simple language and by using concrete examples. By the time she left the office, she was empowered by her newly acquired knowledge, grateful to support, and proud that she'd moved into the next phase of her life where she could pay for her own health insurance. I'd like to say that Sal Sally's story ended happily ever after, but like many restaurant workers, this isn't the case. Sally was laid off from her job a couple of weeks ago. Once again, her future is unknown and she's anxious and stressed about what lay ahead. With all the uncertainty in her life, she said she felt relief knowing that at least a, a quick phone call to a familiar voice was all that was needed to figure out her health insurance and next steps. I think we're gonna see an awful lot of that in the coming days. Kit, there's one other thing I just wanted to add and, and Dana and Heidi talked about it a little bit, but when you only have three staff members, if one of them goes down with COVID-19, 
we're in big trouble. So that that's where it comes into play. And, and it's very nerve wracking how we're going to continue to help and serve these people. It's time. It's more time consuming than ever right now because of the system we're trying to work in, but it's a huge concern. Thank you. And Heidi, I think I was on mute when I was thanking uh, the others, you and the others uh, for joining us here today. Uh, I'd like to uh, open it up to questions from our committee members and I see uh, Representative, Ro Representative Rogers. Thank you. Um, I, I have a few questions and I think I'll just lay them out there and then see if there's responses. Um, the first is, is more of kind of a question about, about Medicaid enrollment, which is that I actually, prior to this testimony today, I had not been hearing from my constituents or others I'd been in contact with about issues of getting on Medicaid in a timely fashion. This is the first I'm actually hearing about that. So I'm kind of curious to hear if this is a particular instance with a, a few particular families or a, a more systemic problem we should know about. Um, that's one piece. Secondly, I was wondering if there are, um, if you're, if the coalition is open to anybody who chooses to use the services, or if there are um, particular, if there's an application or qualifications of who is served by the coalition. Um, and then my, and then my third question was related to the work that's being done with migrant farm workers and whether there are legislative actions that you see as necessary. Um, or whether it was whether yeah whether there's legislative actions that you see as necessary. Let's let's open it up to any one of the witnesses to respond to Representative Rogers' uh, series of questions. So I'm <laughs> going to ask you to take turns and jump in. Since I brought up the timeliness of Medicaid approval, I can I can talk a little bit to that. Um, it it's been an ongoing issue, not just for Magi Medicaid which is for people under 65 and not disabled, but also for Green Mountain Care. Um, for a couple of different reasons, like I said, since COVID-19 uh, came into play, they're doing manual reviews to make sure that all the people who have a change in eligibility, um, that they aren't throwing anybody off. So they don't wanna take anybody off of Medicaid. So that slows the process right there. Then you also have people who may be going on for the first time and there may be some pending issues. Those also have to be manually reviewed. When you throw that all into a system that's already overtaxed because they've had a COVID-19 outbreak, it, it, it's a big deal. So uh, why? It, it, I will tell you that on the case I spoke of, there was no reason for that case to be languishing. It's an ongoing issue of the different portals they have in the Medicaid system and they don't talk to each other. So when there's a conflict like different addresses or slightly different spelling of a name or something like that, it creates a huge issue in the system and people don't get on and they can't access care because they're still not showing as active. That's been an ongoing issue for a long time. And like I said, now with COVID-19 and the manual processing thrown into the mix, I, it's definitely lengthening it. And I know a lot of that is the system is just overtaxed. And I think I'd like to respond to the question about eligibility, income eligibility. So Good Neighbor Clinic runs a free medical clinic and a free dental clinic. And I joined the organization just six years ago, shortly after the Affordable Care Act um, was implemented. And on the medical side, it's very clear that the patients who needed us had shifted slightly from people who were uninsured to people who are underinsured. And we made the decision in the medical clinic not to um, request that or require that people be under a certain income limit to receive services. However, the dental clinic had such an unrelenting demand for services that we felt it necessary to keep the 250% of the federal poverty level um, income eligibility. Now, here's what's really interesting. We still collect all the demographics and the income information on all the patients. And we can say for sure that everybody at Red Logan is under 250% of federal poverty level. 
98% of the people who use the medical clinic are under 300% of the poverty level. So it hasn't really changed who's used the clinic. It, it in fact, just made it more welcoming, I think. I'll just add quickly onto that to say that each of the clinics has a difference, can have different policies about uh, eligibility. And so some uh, continue to have uh, some income eligibility requirements, others don't. Um, so it does vary a little bit clinic by clinic. And I would say, Representative Rogers, that for us at Open Door, um, we our criterion is that one has to be at or below 300% of the federal poverty level. So for a family of one, that would mean that one could make $3,190 or less per month to qualify to see us. The vast majority, probably 97% of our clients um, are uninsured versus underinsured. Um, so there is that essential, and we have some wiggle room, um, uh, but that's our basic eligibility criterion. Um, and as far as legislation, and I'm going to call on Mari, who is one of our wonderful volunteers, but um, you know, I, um, I'm not sure I can really answer this intelligently. I think if anything, I would love to see a day when our migrant workers are eligible for Vermont Health Connect and insurance in the state of Vermont health insurance. With regard, um, uh, with regard to um, getting through this pandemic and potential lost wages um, and things that they might be struggling with and in the non-healthcare sector of their life, which is also part of our health. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what might be a good solution. I know from seeing our patients in general or through what I've learned from Julia, sometimes when people get ill, um, their employers will continue to pay them short term. Sometimes they're kicked off the farm. There is a broad continuum of treatment and philosophies around what they can and and can't do or what they will or won't do. And some of our farmers are very poor themselves. So Mari, do you have anything to add to that? I agree with you 100%. I would like that um, universally anyone who lives in Vermont would be able to access healthcare, um, period. And I, if there is a way to get um, any kind of funding to um, your clinics, um, and in particular to the, the um, migrant farm workers. I know Addison Allies is a group that's raising funds um, to support migrant farm workers that might be out of work or might be, um, might be ill. Um, I think finding funding sources somehow during this, this crisis would be immensely helpful. I did ask um, Vermont Community Foundation if um, it would be possible for them to award the Eric Rosendahl um, scholarship. Eric was a, an organic farmer um, in Starksboro that, that died suddenly um, a year or two ago. And there's a $5,000 scholarship. I did ask if they might consider um, awarding that to the uh, migrant farm workers. Um, I haven't um, got one reply back. I haven't heard um, more. I'd just like to add one other thing um, off of this topic, Representative Rogers, but kind of big picture. You know, when I think about us, um, as our role or piece of a bigger part of a healthcare delivery system in Addison County, I think that one of the things that we can do and contribute to is, um, especially at this time, helping the hospital be able to focus their efforts and their energies on the, on the COVID patients. And so I think our attempts at triaging, um, uh, continuing to, see our patients and triage them um, and use our best skills to 
um, either continue to send them to express care or the ED, but to hopefully, um, you know, def uh, prevent unnecessary, if you will, visits to our ERs right now um, is another way that we're all making contributions within our network um, to the to the broader picture and supporting um, this horrible harrowing ordeal. So can I ask, uh, I see that I don't think Jen is with us still, but Nolan is. Um, can I ask that our legislative council specifically provide us with any information about what the barriers, if there are federal barriers or barriers that exist uh, that we can remove in Vermont in terms of access to any type of health coverage, health insurance coverage for uh, migrant workers or undocumented workers. I have, a, I have a sense that there are barriers that but I would like us to understand as clearly as possible if there's any barriers that we have control over that we can remove. So Nolan, if you would pass that along to Jen as well. I'll do that. See, okay, thank you. Um, I see that we have a number of other hands up and we're, so I'm gonna quickly keep moving through. Uh, Brian, uh, Representative China. Yes, um, I have one question. If uh, if the time comes when you start uh, losing some of your workforce due to illness, will you have access to volunteers and resources from the Medical Reserve Corps for your clinics? I can answer that. Um, many of our volunteers are active with the Medical Reserve Corps. Um, I don't see us needing to go beyond the 24 physicians that we have actively as volunteers, what we just need to do is set up that telehealth system. And, you know, each week we have a, we have a new technological challenge. So that's next. I would echo what Dana says at this time, Representative China. Um, we have 170 volunteers and a, a huge cohort of those are um, interpreters, but we have quite a number and it's hard for me to imagine, a, a number of them are retired and we have um, felt very protective of them at this time, but um, at, at, at this point, I think we would be okay, but um, every day is different. I agree with Dana that um, um, continuing to confront this new way of doing business and our, our paucity of technological resources and building upon those is probably where we need to put a greater effort. Representative Page. I have a couple of comments and questions and I'll just put them out there for you and you can respond appropriately. I noticed in your annual report summary for 2019 from Barrie to Burlington uh, North um, you have no services whatsoever, um, but I I'm assuming um, that those services are made up of, are made up by other agencies that are doing similar work to your your um, your agency. Um, and we also have a number of migrant workers working at farms in the Northeast Kingdom as well. Regarding your uh, <coughs> your grant monies that you receive from the state. I don't know how much monies you receive from the state, but you do mention also that you receive uh, $4.3 million of support from local hospitals. I would assume that those funds will probably, um, hopefully not, but probably will be uh, maybe cut uh, um, this year due to this virus. I hope not, but I, just, I'd like to get your ideas on this. And then um, with additional funds that are coming from the feds through um, the UI uh, uh, funding and, and also this care program, um, will that affect eligibility for, um, for patients that may otherwise um, be eligible for Medicaid? So I'll, I'll listen to your responses. Well, I'll just, um... 
just quickly on the funding that we received, the, the larger number that you quoted, uh, uh, I believe refers to in-kind uh, contributions from hospitals. So those are um, uh, donated uh, space in some cases, donated imagery, imaging services. Uh, again, each clinic is different, so, but we do go through a process to value those donated services from hospitals. So um, our, some of the clinics do receive direct financial contributions from clinics, but it's nowhere near that total amount of money. Uh, we do uh, receive a uh, uh, 1 million, 1028, um, total appropriation each year in the budget that supports, that comes through the coalition, comes through my organization and is distributed um, out to the clinics to support the work that they do. I think Lynn, Lynn might have, uh, we were just talking this morning about your question, I believe around do the, would the, will the unemployment benefits and such uh, create problems uh, be counted toward eligibility determinations? I think the answer is we don't know yet, um, but Lynn may have more she wants to say about that. The unemployment will be counted towards their eligibility. The question is, when are they gonna know how much they're getting? and when they actually start collecting the check, normally that's when we start counting it towards their eligibility for the healthcare programs. The stimulus part of it, they're supposed, excuse me, economic incentive they're supposed to receive. My understanding is that will not count towards their income eligibility for the programs. But truthfully, there's no guidance out there on that yet. So that's just based on Googling and reading as much as I can. Um, but, but that's the thing. We're kind of at the bottom end of the chain sometimes when it comes to eligibility guidance. So it'd be nice to pick up the pace a little bit because we, we're seeing these patients firsthand. And, and do you expect that you're going to receive the same amount from the state of Vermont for your grant monies that you did last year? Uh, and I jump in and just say that I don't think anybody has any idea what the state is going to be able to do. The budget of last year was just basically put in a drawer by the Appropriations Committee and they're starting afresh. I, honestly, I don't think they're in any position to, we're, and we're not in a position to say anything as well. I think it, and, and the part of why we wanna hear from these clinics is also it's, it becomes a matter of advocacy on our part as well with our colleagues. Sorry to jump into it, I just, I don't think there's any way to know. We were, we were I will just say we were, included level funded in the governor's proposed budget for whatever that's worth. Uh, Representative Cordes. Back to the conversation about migrant workers, um, the public charge, the federal public charge rule went into effect in February. And um, one of the major public health concerns is um, for people that are afraid to go um, get medical help, um, afraid of ICE, afraid of border patrol. Um, what are we seeing? Um, Heidi, can you talk about that in maybe in Addison County or Steve? Um, I, I, I don't, well, I should pull in Julia actually, because I, I, uh, probably don't have enough information in my own head to answer you right now, Mari. Um, I think that we're, we're still getting a lot of calls from um, our, the migrant workers who we serve um, and have sent several to Express Care and the ED in the last couple of weeks with things. In terms of um, feeling a greater sense of isolation and um, uh, fear um, with regard to the um, COVID-19, I can't adequately address that at the moment, but we're happy to report in after we deliver some of these boxes. Um, and, uh, and I can also check with Julia and Naomi, our colleague in the northern tier of the state where the landscape is quite a bit different and much more threatening to migrant workers, um, if what she's seeing at this time. That would be great. Thanks, Heidi. Sure. Oh, and Representative Page, I just wanted to say you bring up um, 
great points, delicate points. I think things that we think about when we're feeling really vulnerable <laughs> um, as we're responsible for fundraising at our clinics. But, um, you know, uh, for instance, the support we get from Porter Medical Center is uh, rent free or lease free space. We share a trailer with another Porter office. Um, and they're very generous to our patients in terms of lab and radiology services um, that they provide. Uh, and um, they also gifted us um, a small grant to help uh, cover part of the cost of our navigator in the last two years. That I could see potentially going away if they start to suffer through all of this. I mean, who knows? Um, I think we are respected by them and they would be very reluctant to, um, you know, not give us space any longer or not be able to serve our patients through radiology. Um, but we, we sh we'll see. And I would appreciate continued advocacy on all of your parts for us over the long haul. I know you'll probably all have to make very, very difficult decisions um, as our entire state suffers on very new levels. Um, but I think we're really important in the healthcare delivery system and do things nobody else really does. Um, if I may, um, just a comment about migrant workers. I uh, spoke to a local farm uh, in our district and he was saying due to the coronavirus, um, he had not had um, too many recent visits um, by um, by ICE personnel, and um, it's my understanding that they're pretty busy along the northern border. So um, I don't know whether that uh, eases some fears for um, some workers, but um, it's just one farm that I had, had spoken to yesterday. Thank you. Representative Christensen. And then, and then after that, uh, Representative Smith, and then I think we're probably going to need to wind it up for the morning. Hi. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for everything you've done. It's been a real eye opener to see the fire hose of things that are coming at you. But I was wondering, and you say you've thrown out new models, and I know you're living just in the moment. But when you talk about triaging cases, and keeping them from the ER. Is there ever a point, I, you know, as I said, you're living moment to moment at night, you went, wow, that worked really good that we could take into the future with us? This, this is Dana, I'll answer that. I, um, you know, we, all of us have a very, we have a lean staffing model and we have lean budgets. So, when I was approached by some of our volunteer physicians a couple of years ago, and they suggested that I hire a, a nurse practitioner instead of a RN to provide our patient case management, I kind of gulped because their pay scale is quite a bit higher than an RN. At any rate, it took us over a year to fill the position, but we did it. We have a wonderful nurse practitioner. And the beauty of that is that she can provide that level of triage to patients who are calling um, her, herself. I mean, so they, the call comes in and then she calls them back from home right now. Uh, if I, if, and someone asked, you know, what happens if our staff gets sick? That's a huge worry for me because if something happens to her, it, it means that our volunteers have to step in and then it, it's another layer of complexity. That being said, our medical providers, are, they are reaching out to patients too and contacting them um, by phone primarily. Um, but, you know, it, it's a system that's put together um, elegantly. I will say it's an elegant system and it's very simple. Um, not, but it doesn't have a lot of redundancy. Does that answer your question? It does to a, to yeah, some it degree. Does. Yeah, I got, I got it's it. Hard. It's hard. I try to stay. I try to stay a step or two ahead in the planning, but not ten steps ahead. I know. I know. And 
at this point, you're probably just living, as I said, moment to moment, just keep on moving, you know, people. So thank you for all that. Thank you. I think. Oh, I was just going to say to Representative Christensen, um, you know, uh, our nurses have always triaged. They do an impeccable job and have an, a lot of autonomy because we don't have an NP or an MD here during the week. Um, and so I think it's more for us an extension of how we're doing business. The nurses are taking the phone home at night. We're covering the phones on the weekends. Um, and we typically haven't done that in the past. Um, and we always have a consciousness about us to, um, to uh, you know, um, do our best job of pointing patients where they need to go, either coming to our clinic or going to express care. And because we only have a clinic or two a week, there is always a dynamic for us that we can't see the patient because it's not clinic night or it's not going to be clinic night for five days and we need to send them to, the, to express care. So I think it's more, more of the same, and, but, but at, a, at a different level and with a little more... Um, uh, I don't know, attention as all of this is unfolding and we're reevaluating every day. Lynn, do you have used telehealth in Springfield? So we're, we are a referral clinic. Uh -huh. So the SMCS providers do use telehealth and um, they have screening processes in place. They have a drive up testing site in place. So we're all coordinated with them. So when we make a referral or a patient calls us with possible symptoms, the first thing we're gonna do is refer them directly to that hotline through Springfield Medical Care Systems to have them screen and, and a determination made as to whether or not um, they need to be tested. They also have a walk-in clinic there that, so if somebody doesn't have a regular PCP, um, they have a walk-in clinic there. So somebody who just has <clears throat> say they're from New York or something, um, happens to, to need to, to get screened through a provider. Um, there's that number there that we referred people to so they, get, they can call in and get screened. But for us, we're not providing the care on site. So we're not providing any medical triage, but we were referring them directly to the line that does. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. So Brian, Representative Smith, uh, I think this will be our last question for the morning. Thank you, I'll be brief. Uh, I was listening about the conversation about trying to find funding, additional funding for the migrant workers. Are we talking about migrant workers with visas and green cards, or are we talking about illegal migrant workers? Uh, well, the vast majority of migrant workers who we serve, Representative Smith, are uh, we don't ask about their documentation status. We assume that they're undocumented. Um, you know, the dairy industry, there isn't a legal means by which to come into this country and work on our dairy farms because they're considered year round employment. So there isn't a legal means by which for dairy workers to um, have papers and. So, so well, if we found funding, additional funding for migrant workers, and they were illegal, you want to include them as well? Yes, in terms of healthcare, absolutely. A lot of so, them are paying into our social security system and our government and, and um, they're, they're boosting our economy and part of our fabric. So I would be an advocate for opening up health insurance to our dairy farm, to our migrant workers who are on our dairy farms. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, I think, uh, I think I'm going to bring us to a close for the morning. Uh, thank you for uh, each of the witnesses, uh, Steve, for uh, helping to arrange this. And it's, it's always um, important to hear what's happening on the front lines of your work and it helps us think about what it is that we can do both in terms of the immediacy, but also the longer term vision for access to healthcare for all Vermonters. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank I think you. Uh, thank at, you this, all. And at thank this you point, for, uh... I'm going to suggest to, so yeah. 
So th thank you, Steve. Thank you, Lynn, Dana. Um, thank you. Heidi, thank you. Heidi, yes, thank you. Sorry. Okay, so you guys welcome you to leave, leave our meeting for now. And Demis, I think you can take us off of YouTube.